in the field of global change biology right now, there's some many interesting things happening, and there are probably two things that are going on. One is borrowing technology from other fields and disciplines, and two is sort of a rediscovery of old questions that we've had in biology and evolution for quite some time. So, for example, there's a paper published in Nature a little while that was a kind of a news item, and it was called Evology, and it was about how ecologists used to think that, oh, evolution doesn't matter to me, and I don't have to worry about that discipline. But in fact, the byline of the article was, but they were wrong. And so in some systems, things that are going on on the ecological side can eventually change the evolutionary trajectory of the population. So for example, I study uh, kelp forests in California right now, and the kelp themselves are like bioreactors, these um, marine plants that um, release CO2, or take in CO2 and release oxygen. And they change the chemistry of the water, and by doing that, they can also change the physiology of the animals. And so you might have things that are as different as uh, your, the quality of food changes, so that um, a predator then is getting a different kind of food quality, or it's, or it's, you know, in a climate change context, its food migrates and disappears. So we look at how ecology could drive evolution, and this is a really big thing to think about because it fits really well into global change biology, especially in the oceans. And in another project that we've been working on in there, um, we call it Who's Your Mommy? Because those ocean conditions can change how females um, make their eggs and how they then condition their progeny for future conditions. But the inspiration for that project really came from Morgan Kelly, who worked with us a few years ago. And she uh, opened up this can of worms, Who's Your Daddy? so that um, sires, male sea urchins who had been exposed to a lot of low pH conditions, actually sired progeny, their baby sea urchin kids, were a little bit tougher in the face of low pH and upwelling conditions that we see in California. So some of these observations are really important ecologically, but they're very important um, in terms of thinking about other things that you wouldn't expect, like food security and food systems. But Morgan's really been the person who's brought evolution, borrowing from other fields and population biology into global change science. And so in my lab at Louisiana State University, we like to think of evolution and ecology as these two processes that feed back with one another. Ecology affects evolution and evolution affects ecology. And right now we're working with oysters, with American oysters. And this is a phenomenally important fishery in Louisiana. And right now they're threatened by climate change, mostly by the fact that climate change is increasing the amount of fresh water that oysters experience. And oysters can deal with a lot of variability, but they're not freshwater animals. They right. do live in the ocean. And so they are really stressed out by having a lot of fresh water. And right now climate change is causing our region to get these really big rainfall events that dump huge amounts of fresh water into the estuaries where oysters live. A couple years ago, we got 24 inches of rain <laughs> over just two days. Wow. And in some of the oyster populations that we monitor, the salinity went down to fresh. It was like they were living in a lake. Mm. And they can actually handle that for, for a little bit of time. They just close up and kind of wait for, wait for the bad <laughs> conditions to, <laughs> to stop. But while they're all closed up, they're not eating. And if they're not eating, they're not able to fatten up and uh, get ready to have babies and mm -hmm. so this really affects their reproduction and one of the things we're trying to understand is if different populations of oysters might differ in their ability to deal with that freshwater stress mm -hmm. and whether their history of exposure to freshwater makes it so you know once again who's your daddy uh, and who's your mommy in the in the case of oysters does uh, whether or not your parents live somewhere with a lot of fresh water does that affect your ability to deal with freshwater stress in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because it might affect which populations we focus on for conservation. And mm -hmm. it might also affect how we decide to restore these populations. Because when we go to restore populations, we might breed oysters in a hatchery and then put their progeny back out in the wild. And we want to choose parents that are going to be the toughest, the toughest yeah. and most able to deal with that freshwater. So, you know, we've been talking a little bit about how ecology pushes evolution, or you could even think about, sometimes scientists call it ecological evolutionary mm -hmm. dynamics. 
and it's all playing out in a global change context right now in marine systems. And I'm just wondering, Morgan, what do you think is the horizon for this? What are some of the most important experiments we can be doing? Mm. And what are some of the challenges to early career scientists who are coming into this right now? That's a great question. So I think it's really important to continue to think about variation among individuals and the species we work on. You know, we look at oysters and we might think every oyster looks That's exactly right. like every other oyster, but every oyster is an individual. That's right. And some of them are really good at dealing with stress and some of them are not so good at dealing with stress. And so we need to find new ways to measure variation among individuals mm -hmm. and really consider the history of the populations that we work on and how that might inform which populations and which individuals are most able to deal with, with climate change stress. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that's borrowing theory from population biology that's going to really be at the heart of doing that better? Or are there approaches that... Yeah, I think, I think theory, I think we need to borrow theory from population biology, and we also have some really exciting new techniques mm. that we can borrow from fields like medicine right. and yeah. evolutionary genetics to measure and test differences among populations. Great. Exciting times. It's a challenge, but uh, we're building the tools and we're recruiting the scientists <laughs> we need to address these global problems.